We've all done stupid things while drunk. I personally once challenged someone to a breakdancing competition, despite the fact that I cannot breakdance. However, when someone commits a criminal act as a result of intoxication through alcohol or drugs, this becomes a different matter entirely. People often think of intoxication as a defence, but that's not strictly true. For a defence, you're basically saying that a person has committed the actus reus and the mens rea of an offence, but is putting forward a defence as a justification for their actions. Intoxication, on the other hand, is a denial of criminal responsibility. They're saying, yes, I committed the actus reus or the acting part of an offence, but I did not have the intention, or certainly not the criminal intention, required to do so. For this lecture, we're going to focus on three key questions. The first of these is, was the intoxication voluntary or involuntary? So voluntary intoxication when you go out on the lash with your mates. Involuntary intoxication would be when someone spikes your drink. The second question that we're going to focus on is when we're looking at voluntary intoxication, what type of crime is it? Is it a crime of specific intent or is it a crime of basic intent? And the final question that we're going to look at is how dangerous was the drug? Is it a known drug that was dangerous, such as alcohol that is known to make people more violent? Or is it a new drug or a drug that can have particular effects on certain people that are perhaps unknown at that particular time? With these three questions in mind, let's go through the points on intoxication. So the key principle behind this lecture is that intoxication is essentially a denial of mens rea. With this in mind, we can say that if the defendant does rely on intoxication, then proof of the mens rea will also be proof of guilt. This was a point that was very well put in the case of Pordage in 1975. But we do have to remember that the obverse is true as well. In other words, if the mens rea is not proved, then the defendant will not be guilty. Remember, the onus of proof in such cases is always on the Crown. This was established in the 1975 case of Sheehan. It was challenged in McKnight where it was suggested that the defendant not only had to prove that they were intoxicated, but also that they lacked the requisite mens rea. But this is a standalone case that has been heavily criticised because it appears to go against one of the basic tenets of criminal law, that a person is innocent until proven otherwise. In other words, it's up to the Crown to not only prove the actus reus of, a, of an offence that someone is charged with, but also the mens rea as well. Involuntary intoxication is very narrowly defined. In Allen in 1988, the court was keen to point out that where a person had taken too much of a substance um, involuntarily or perhaps had taken a substance that they didn't realise how strong it was, then that will not be enough to qualify for involuntary intoxication. Remember with involuntary intoxication as well, so for example where a person's drink gets spiked, there is still a requirement of a lack of mens rea. Perhaps the most um, famous case involving involuntary intoxication was Kingston in 1994, where the person did have their drink spiked and went on to sexually assault a 15-year-old boy. During the court case, it was proved that the defendant did have paedophilic tendencies anyway and may have committed the offence even if they were sober. And so the defendant in such a case did have the mens rea and therefore couldn't rely on intoxication. For criminal offences that involve negligence, the question that we have to ask is, would the reasonable person, in other words, an objective test, have acted in the same way, having suffered from the same involuntary intoxication as the defendant? Voluntary intoxication is a little bit more complicated, so a defendant is not guilty if he did not form the mens rea for a crime of specific intent. Now, specific intent is contrasted with basic intent, but the courts have really struggled since the 1970s to actually get a good definition down of what a crime of specific intent is and what a crime of basic intent with it is. For specific intent, the main case is Majewski from 1973, and they suggested that it was crimes with an ulterior intent, in other words, where the mens rea goes beyond the actus reus of an offence. This was okay, but the main problem was that 
such a definition wouldn't include murder because the actus reus, i.e. the killing of a person, it was not possible for the mens rea to go above and beyond that. So in 2007, in the case of Heard, they tried to adapt the definition and said that, well, we can take the definition that was given in Majewski from 1973, but we can also add to that that a crime of specific intent is also a crime where there was a sort of purposive intent, trying to give a sort of everyday meaning to the words. I'm still not sure that this is particularly well defined by the courts even today, and also one of the other major criticisms of Majewski and the subsequent case law is that where there is voluntary intoxication and a crime of basic intent, it almost presents the Crown with the opportunity to not have to prove the mens, uh, prove the mens rea, which is obviously again going against some of the basic principles of criminal law, like I mentioned earlier. I do think that maybe the best way to define specific and basic intent is to look through a wider range of case law and to draw from that which offences the courts have considered over the years to be crimes of specific intent and crimes of basic intent. So we have specific intent on the left hand side and basic intent on the right hand side and I'll let you read through those in your own time. The one that I want to focus on is at the bottom of the table and we can see that criminal damage with intent is a crime of specific intent and this seems to um, coalesce with the ideas put forward in Majewski and Heard that the mens rea should go beyond the actus reus or that there should be a purposive intent involved. We can then contrast that with on the other side the basic intent crime of criminal damage through recklessness where the mens rea doesn't quite match up to the actus reus or there isn't really a purposive intent involved in that crime and perhaps that's the best example for giving a contrast between the two. If you remember back to the introduction, you'll remember that the third question we were going to look at is the nature of the drugs involved. And the question that we have to ask with any particular drug or substance is, is it common knowledge that using the drug is liable to make the user become aggressive? So to give an obvious example, taking alcohol, for example, um, in large quantities is very likely to make a person become aggressive. And so we can answer that in the positive and say that a person would be liable in such circumstances. Where it's not clear if taking such a drug would make the user aggressive, we have to look at a question of recklessness. This may be cases where a person's body reacts strangely to a particular substance or where the effects of a substance are not widely known. In such a case, we have to look at the quote from Griffiths Lord Justice in Bailey from 1983, and I've put that in full there. So it says, if he does appreciate the risk that taking the drug may lead to aggressive, unpredictable and uncontrollable conduct, and he nevertheless deliberately runs the risk of or otherwise disregards it, this will amount to recklessness. What Lord Justice Griffiths is basically saying then is a subjective test in the first instance. So does the defendant appreciate the risk that taking the drug could lead to that type of behaviour? And then a more general assessment of whether the defendant deliberately ran that risk. Before we finish, there are a few other considerations to take into account. So in some cases, such as Jagged and Dickinson, which involved breaking into someone's house, there was a statutory defence available, and so intoxication didn't apply in those circumstances. Um, generally speaking as well, a mistake from voluntary intoxication will not be allowed as a defence in the case of O'Grady 1987, also followed up in the case of Hatton from 2005. We can see in this circumstance where policy also plays a role in the law on intoxication. So obviously the courts don't want people to go around saying, oh, well, I did get um, pissed up on Friday night, uh, but I just made a mistake. Therefore, I shouldn't be guilty of an offence. Obviously, that's not an ideal situation. And so we can see cases like O'Grady that have put a stop to that. Also in Attorney General for Northern Ireland and Gallagher, 1963, 
um, Lord Denning held that Dutch uh, taking a drink for Dutch courage would not be a defence because the person had formed the mens rea before taking the alcohol or other substance. Intoxication then could come up as either a problem question or an essay question in an exam. If it comes up as a problem question, remember to focus on the idea that intoxication is not necessarily a defence as such, it's more a denial of mens rea, and so you should look at the intention of the person involved, remembering to look at those three questions I mentioned at the start. So was it voluntary or involuntary intoxication? If it was voluntary intoxication, was it a crime of specific or basic intent? And then also looking at the type of drug that was involved as well, trying to follow that structure throughout your response. If it comes up as an essay question, this could be potentially very interesting for you because it involves a particular area of policy where the courts have become actively involved. Should a person be able to get away with committing a criminal offence simply on the basis that they were drunk? Generally, in the minds of the courts, the answer is no, and this has led to some quite strict interpretations. You may also want to consider the difficulties that the court have had in defining both crimes of basic and specific intent. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. If you did find it useful, then remember to leave it a like. Also, subscribe for more videos in the future, and if you have any comments or questions or queries, then leave those below in the comments. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.